It's time now for our big story of the day. The top secret Henderson Brooks Bhagat report of the failures of the 1962 war has been leaked by the Australian journalist Neville Maxwell. The government had kept the report under lock and key for 50 years, although one copy had been provided to Mr. Maxwell by sources. The report is deeply critical of India's political and military leadership during the war. It says Nehru's so-called forward policy certainly increased chances of a conflict. It added that the government and the military were not on the same page and that the military was not prepared to carry out Nehru's political diktats. It also highlighted the deep disconnect between the army headquarters led by General P. N. Thapar and his various field formations. Finally, it outlines the tactical reasons as well as for India's defeat in that war. Now one example of the disconnect at the top was the conflicting advice given to Nehru by the Intelligence Bureau and the military. While the Intelligence Bureau said that China would not react to India's forward policy, the army warned that China would resist with force if any attempt was made to take territory. Now here's what the Henderson Brooks report says in detail. First, the introduction of the forward policy certainly increased chances of conflict. Second, while the forward policy was politically desirable, the military was in no position to implement it. Third, the Army Headquarters gave no operational or intelligence appreciation to its field formations. Fourth, that the Army Headquarters did not convey the decision to reinforce forward units to its formations before the battle. Fifth, if such a decision was conveyed, the Army's Western Command would have informed Headquarters that it was unable to implement the policy. And finally, that the forward policy was implemented by Army Headquarters without adequate backup. Now, defence scholars and experts have come down heavily on the government for keeping the report secret for so long. Listen in. Cannot possibly search on its own. I am therefore very pleased that so many countries have come forward to offer assistance and also support to the search and rescue operation. In terms of the deployment of specific assets, today the Royal Malaysian Navy deployed two more ships to the Southern Corridor. This deployment includes the Superlinks helicopter, which can operate from either ship. This brings the total number of nation ships deployed to the Southern Corridor to four, with two, two Superlinks helicopters. Today, Malaysia also deployed two C-130 aircraft to the Indonesian sector of the Southern Search Corridor. Other countries are also contributing the following assets. The United States has deployed one P-8 Poseidon and will redeploy the P-3 Orion aircraft. Australia, as I mentioned yesterday, has deployed three P-3 Orions and one C-130 Hercules. New Zealand has, is redeploying a P-3 Orion to support Australian search efforts. The Republic of Korea has committed one P-3 Orion and one C-130 Hercules. Japan has committed two P-3 Orions, two C-130s and one Gulfstream jet. The UAE has committed one C-17 aircraft and one Bombardier Dash 8 aircraft. The assets from Korea, Japan and UAE are currently in Malaysia awaiting orders from their respective governments. Aside from deploying its assets to the Northern Corridor, China has also made arrangements with Australia to deploy an aircraft to the Southern Corridor. I would like to clarify what has been said about ACAS and the sequence of events before the air turned back. On Saturday, we stated that I quote, based on new satellite information, we can say with high degree of certainty that the aircraft communication addressing reporting system ACAS was disabled just before the aircraft reached the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia. Shortly afterwards, near the border between Malaysia and Vietnamese air traffic control, the aircraft transporter was switched off. These findings were drafted together with representatives from the lead international investigators based on the information available at that time. Yesterday, Malaysian Airlines clarified that we cannot determine exactly what ACAS has been disabled, only that it occurred within a specific time range from 107 approximately when the aircraft reached the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia and the last ACAS transmission occurred to 137, which was the next scheduled reporting time. This is indeed the case. This does not change our belief, as stated, that up until the point at which it left military primary radar coverage, the aircraft's movements were consistent with deliberate action by someone on the plane. That remains the position of the investigating team. It is also important to recognize that the precise time ACARS was disabled 
has no bearing on the search and rescue operation. We, during this difficult time, as we focus on finding the aircraft and the 239 people on board. The search for MH370 remains our top priority. We will continue to provide you with operational updates, including further information about assets being deployed as soon as they are available. In the last few days, we have been intensively contacting our friends across the search regions. The cooperation we saw in the first phase continues in this new phase. In fact, there's even more commitment to assist us in this much larger and more complex multinational operation. In the meantime, our thoughts remain with the families and friends of those on board. Thank you, Honourable Minister, on your statement. And now, and now, I request the pleasure of the Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs to deliver his statement. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I just want to give you briefly what the task of the Foreign Ministry that has been entrusted to us. First is to seek the assistance from the uh, search and rescue operations. And uh, the, there are 25 countries that's involved. And uh, we have sent 12, uh, 12 diplomatic notes to the Northern Corridor and two to Southern Corridor. Now, the response has been excellent. And uh, this is due to the good relations that we have with all countries, and especially the Prime Minister, who had called many uh, presidents to seek the assistance. And uh, there are nine other countries that does not fall under the two corridors which uh, the Minister has explained that has come forward to assist, namely uh, U US, South Korea, Japan, and others. Now, this is a very complex uh, issue. We're talking about 25 countries and how to coordinate these 25 countries with different ideologies and system of government. But two reasons, two main reasons. One is, of course, as I said, we have excellent relationship with those countries that's involved. Two, because this is something that of concern to all of us on a humanitarian aspect. Now, I have been calling the uh, foreign ministers all those that are involved, and the Prime Minister has spoken to many presidents of the countries and the Prime Ministers, and as, as I said earlier, where and when that this uh, assistance the required, where a country cannot mobilize the assets, then we will come and assist them from, from the operation center here. Now, let me tell you that uh, during our conversations, it's, as I said earlier, it is a very, very complex issue which cover the very wide areas and therefore we fully appreciate all the cooperation that has been given to us and those foreign ministers that has been constantly uh, calling me and to offer assistance and I just came back from Europe and all those uh, countries that I've met, they have expressed sympathies on what has happened and also offered whatever assistance that is required of them in order to to, to locate this aircraft. Now, whatever it takes, I think it's very, very clear, the Minister has made it very clear, our main objective is to locate where the aircraft is found. Politics is not important here. And I don't, do not think, I do not think anybody should see cheap publicity of what happened now. This is an issue of major uh, catastrophe, and therefore all efforts should be focused on finding the blame. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the floor will now be open for Q&A. We'll start with the first session with the local media. So we'll start from this corner, please. Okay. Oh, gentlemen in front here, please. Identify yourself, sir. I'm from TV3, Paris. Dr. Sreen Shawne, the Sublast in the Sorry. Sorry. Okay, the one on that. Okay, mengenai dengan simulator penyiasatan mengatakan ada lima lapangan terbang haram ataupun hantu disiasat di dalam simulator oleh Kapten uh, Sahari dan dan keduanya apa mungkin kerajaan Malaysia sekarang ada 
mendular di social media mengatakan kerana di Malaysia tempat lahir teroris dan mungkin kerajaan Malaysia ingin mengatakan sesuatu Pertamanya dari segi simulator saya uh, nak menyatakan di sini bahawa uh, semasa IGP menghadiri PC kita dahulu uh, ia tak ada timbul pun uh, perkara yang dibangkitkan tadi tetapi dalam masa terdekat saya percaya bahawa pihak polis boleh maklumkan kepada orang ramai hasil siasatan mereka berhubung kait dengan simulator tadi berhubung kait dengan uh, dakwaan bahawa Malaysia merupakan uh, uh, sarang teroris saya dulu 5 tahun sebagai Menteri Dalam Negeri dengar um, dakwaan-dakwaan seperti itu juga tetapi memang jelas ianya tidak uh, tidak ada langsung asas apatah lagi kalau nak kaitkan dengan apa yang kita lalui hari ini isu terorisme ini telah dibangkitkan apabila dua um, penumpang daripada Iran yang menggunakan pasport palsu dan apabila dah disiasat dan telah pun dimengesahkan oleh agensi-agensi riset di pengkat antarabangsa jelas ianya tidak ada asas langsung jadi nak kaitkan insiden ini dengan dakwaan bahawa Malaysia merupakan sarang teroris itu saya menafikan dengan sekeras-kerasnya Tuan Sri Suri Nari Ashrawali ini soalan juga kepada Tuan Sri Anifah Tuan Sri, there might be difficulties among those 25 countries who are involved in the search and rescue as you know some of them do not enjoy good diplomatic relations with each other so do you foresee this would hinder them from rendering full support in this massive effort and also a question to the Tuan Shah Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, India, you say that they never seen any unidentified plane entering their airspace so do you think it's now time to maybe you know, go focus more on the southern corridors and if so, have you received any red information from Indonesia who are at the southern corridor? Yeah, you you are absolutely right that is a very very complex uh, situation and to uh, together 25 countries to work together as a team is, is a tremendous effort but one one thing is for sure uh, we have one advantage because uh, the government of Malaysia has a cordial relationship with all those countries concerned and as I said earlier because the Prime Minister is uh, on a phone call basis with most of the foreign ministers and the president and therefore therefore the uh, the ability to communicate and also their willingness to assist and uh, taking into consideration a lot of the other factors including humanitarian aspect but this is will not be possible if Malaysia has not established a good relationship among those countries that are concerned and I think credits must be given to all those other countries and agencies also that are willing to come forward to assist in this operation On Indonesia, I've spoken to Pak Ponormo um, earlier today and uh, he have indicated that there's no new development from previous um, data and information that was provided to us but I uh, requested the Indonesian military to relook again at not only uh, satellite but whatever other data that they may have uh, again in the light of the emphasis uh, on the northern and southern corridor. The southern corridor uh, faces, uh, we face more challenges because the areas, uh, the area is huge. The two countries um, that we are um, seeking assistance from, which are actually geographically in that position, is Australia and Indonesia. And I was uh, speaking to Secretary Chuck Hagel uh, this morning regarding the possibility of looking at the US satellites, radar, and uh, aircraft and vessels uh, to assist us in the southern corridor. Yes, 